Let's open our time of study in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, find ourselves still in this difficult situation. It's perplexing, it's confusing, it's difficult, it's trying, and yet we know that we can trust you through every moment of the trial that is ahead for us. So Lord, as we come to your word for comfort, for solace and instruction, we pray that we might be wise and listen to what your word has to say. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, Hebrews 4.12 tells us, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. What that means is that no matter where you happen to open up to in your, in your Bible, for whatever day's reading, you'll find that it hits you somewhere important. It cuts all the way down to what is most important in every situation. No matter wherever you uh, choose to read in the Bible, you just need to find out where it is that, that it's uh, valuable, that it impacts your life. And yet there's something that happens that's quite remarkable in Bible studies. It's happened to every saint that I've ever had the privilege of discussing the issue with. And that, uh, that is that, you know, you open up your daily devotional, you open up in your daily re- reading, and it just hits you right in the chest. It's exactly what you needed to hear at just that moment, whether that's through you know, our, our daily bread or through some other devotional you're using or, or just through your regular Bible reading plan. It just hits you right where you need uh, to be hit, what you need to understand, what you need to hear in that moment. And like that passage or that devotion, even though it was assembled years earlier, it's as if the Lord in his sovereignty and his plan put it right in front of you at exactly at the time you needed to hear it. And that works right into our circumstance as well. You see, as we study through the Bible, book by book and chapter by chapter and verse by verse, we find that same principle apply. You see, we do this for a very important reason, and that is that we long to hear the Word of God. We don't want to hear the Word of man as much as I like the words that that I have to say most of the time. The reality of the matter is, is that we need to hear from God, and that's why we study most of the time. We'll occasionally do a topical study, but most of the time, We're going to be studying the Bible through verse by verse, because if we don't do that, if we choose to just go through and pick our favorite passages or have the pastor pick his favorite passages or speak on what he is feeling or experiencing at the time, then we run a really incredible risk, and I would say an unspeakably uh, unworthy risk of running over, glossing over the parts of God's Word that might be inconvenient, that might be difficult, that might challenge us uh, to, to really consider what God has to say, right? So if you aren't mostly going through the Bible verse by verse, uh, then the chances are way higher that you're more getting the ideas, the doctrines of men, and not as much or not as clearly the wonderful and, and clear word of God, or if you like, you're getting the words of man and not the words of God. That being said, I set this schedule out in December of 2019, months ago now, as uh, we would study through and move systematically through the book of First Peter, having not the foggiest clue what would be in store for us on April 19th of 2020. And yet here we are, And we find that this passage is just right and very important for us to study in this exact moment in our country, in our world's history. Yes, there are, these are verses you can take uh, some advice given to me by, by my old auntie's rash cream. Apply liberally to all infected areas. So with that in mind, I want to reread our verses today. It says, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who aren't, are set by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, and as free, as free not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. 
honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Now, these valuable and important verses give us a, a, a whole handful of good insights, but I want to note that it starts with that critical word, therefore. It builds upon the last section. What did the last section have to tell us? The last section was talking about how we were to live as godly, live in a righteous way, so that we could put to shame those who would speak against the faith, those who would speak ill against Christianity, those who would speak ill against the truth of what uh, God's word and his wonderful gospel in Jesus Christ has prepared for us. So the next logical step then, as Peter is uh, considering continuing his written discourse, is how do Christians relate to human earthly governmental authorities? Now this is difficult indeed. It was difficult for the Jewish people because as we know, the Jewish people were meant to and were promised by God to be a nation, his nation, his earthly people. And so we can completely understand why the zealots felt the way they felt. The zealots were those who said, we are God's chosen people and we are to be faithful to God and thus be free from any foreign occupation occupation or power, and the zealots said it must be our job to throw off that foreign occupation, those foreign occupiers, right? And we in America, with our, uh, for those of us who are in America, have an interesting attraction, if you like, to freedom. We don't like anybody telling us what we should do and how we should react, and yet the Bible gives us very clear instruction on how we're to relate to human government. This is difficult. Again, there's many of us who, as believers, are tempted or, or even drawn to such ideas as, well, I don't let anyone tell me what to do. God's my only authority. God's the only one who can tell me how to live my life. And the reality, as we'll see, is quite different from that. God is the ultimate authority. But as we're going to see, what it means to walk as a Christian, to walk in faith, to walk in keeping with God's word stands in recognition that God has set up other human authorities and allowed them to exist and exercise that authority even unto this day. And yes, we're absolutely looking forward to the time when this world is ruled by the perfect, wise, and uh, reasonable and wonderful rule of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Yet in this time, we are meant to dwell, as Peter has so well pointed out, as strangers, sojourners, as travelers, as pilgrim, pilgrims through this world. So it begins with an interesting statement. It says, submit yourself or to under attach or to under a gird. The, the Greek word here is hupotasso. It combines the word for under and to attach. So it has the idea of under attaching. This is the same word used by Paul when talking about how wives ought to relate to husbands. And we want to note that in that passage as well, it doesn't just talk about blind obedience. It talks about a supportive role. If you want to, I always imagine this in terms of, you know, someone standing upon a pillar and someone holding the pillar from beneath, right? The person on the pillar might be very active and foolish, but the per person underneath who's holding the pillar up is meant to move and balance with that person on top in order to keep them um, in place, keep them balanced. In, order, in other words, to be supportive in nature. And so this is our opening uh, command, if you like, is that we are meant to take a supportive view, a supportive, as much as is possible, a supportive posture when it comes to understanding and relating to human government. Now we look, it says, uh, submit yourselves to, and it says here, every ordinance of man, the word of ordinance, Ketesis has the idea of um, creation, any creation of man, and this uh, doesn't mean absolutely every person who tells you to do something that you should do it. It has as, as we're going to see in the co greater context, uh, specifically governors and, and uh, kings and, and rulers in view. Nevertheless, the picture here of all or every is expansive. It's inclusive. He doesn't say submit to these authorities when you feel like it. Submit to these authorities when they're respectable. Submit to these authorities when they make good decisions. None of those qualifications are here. Incidentally, none of them are there in uh, Paul's admonition for women to underattach, or wives rather, to underattach and support their husbands. It doesn't say support him if he is good, support him if he is uh, excellent, support him if he's praiseworthy or worthy of your respect. 
He says, support him because that is what honors the Lord and the Lord's um, created order. So uh, we get this rather possibly uncomfortable image, and we're going to come back to this idea continually, but I want to remind you that as Peter wrote this, every human authority to which he would have any kind of access would be an ungodly authority. In the local sphere, we would have, he would have had to deal with the, uh, the various Jewish authorities, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and they were certainly antagonistic, to say the very least, towards the movement of the early church. Furthermore, as we get to the... Um, as you get to the Roman government, we find that the Roman and Greek governments and the various uh, different you know, uh, political situations that would be happening throughout the Roman uh, world, none of them were godly in nature. The, uh, the Caesar himself would claim himself to be a god and demand the worship of all those who were his subjects. That would be impossible for any Jew and impossible for any Christian to abide under, and yet Peter still gives this interesting command. Now, this is important because it's very easy to look around your local government and see things you're unhappy with, or your national government, and see things you're unhappy with, things, see things you don't like, see things you don't support, see things that you know are directly ungodly, that are, that are horrifying. And certainly it is our job as believers to speak out against that unrighteousness, that unholiness, and to be a, a witness, a, a John the Baptist style witness, calling people to understand Understand that they are walking away from God and they need to turn around and walk towards God. They need to know more and, uh, and, and brighten up their way, specifically for us today, by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we're told here, and again, as perplexing as this might be, that we're to submit ourselves to every ordinance of man for, and this is key, for the Lord's sake. Now, uh, this is three simple words in Greek. We don't have the word sake is not in there, but um, rather dia is um, the prepositions that, that's used. It's, it can often mean through, but in this case with the accusative, it can mean because. So in other words, do this, submit yourself to every human authority. Why? Because of the Lord is the short version of this. Be on the basis of our right relationship with the Lord, we are to take a supportive posture towards human government. That is a remarkable statement. In other words, that by honoring the uh, authority structures which the Lord has allowed and we're going to see dictated to be put in place, we are honoring the Lord. It gives a, a, a righteous uh, interaction with those who are in positions of authority when we do this. It's not always our natural bent. In fact, it's never our natural bent. Our natural bent is always towards rebellion and towards sedition. But the truth of the matter is, is that as we walk with Jesus, we will be able to take on a supportive posture. And I want to note that that doesn't mean that we agree with everything that the government will do. It doesn't mean that we um, you know, roll over and die. And we'll even talk uh, for a little bit at the end of uh, at the end of our discussion about uh, what circumstances, uh, in what circumstances rather, we're allowed and uh, enabled by God's word to resist or defy governmental authority. Nevertheless, what this puts is our standing orders. Our standing orders is that as far as it's possible for us to be supportive, we ought to be supportive. We ought to be good citizens in everything that we do, even if it doesn't make sense to us. I'll give you a great example. We've all driven on a road somewhere, somewhere along the line with a speed limit that we view as being entirely oppressive, right? Why in the world? It's a, there's four lanes going either way. Why is it 35 miles an hour? Goodness gracious, there's no reason for such a, an oppressive and ridiculous rule that this should be 45 or 35 miles an hour here. I'll just go 50. No, do not do that. 
even if you don't understand why it's 35 miles an hour at that on that street even if it is absolutely archaic and totally ridiculous the place of the christian is to abide by the laws of the land and abide by the direction and leadership of the government even when that does not um, necessarily make sense even when we say we could have done it better or that needs to change and in certain countries today and most countries uh, you have some opportunity to appeal. So the the thing to do is not to violate the speed limit. The thing to do is uh, go about the natural and proper channels to maybe see that speed limit changed, if that's really something that you have time for. And then he gets to the examples. He says he he wants to make sure that they know. He says, make sure that you're uh, submitting to or submitting yourselves to, right? This middle voice, get get yourself, make yourself submit to these. uh, The king is supreme, right? So that is the, uh, the picture of the highest government. Now, Caesar wasn't necessarily called the king in and of his own right, but it is a general term for the top, whoever's at the top of the government. So maybe where we, we live, it's a, a president who's at the top of the governmental structure, and, and below that we have, you know, the uh, Congress and the judicial system and the executive branch, which the president heads up. But the point is, is that we're meant to take a positive posture in so far as we can, in so much as it relies on on us, going all the way to the top of whatever governmental system under which the Lord has given us to exist. And then it says also as to governors. So that's a picture of the underlings. So if we were to read this right into modern American culture, we'd say <clears throat> to the federal government and to your local government as well. Do not be Uh, rebellious, do not be a troublemaker in any way, because that just gives more reason to blaspheme and profane the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's getting our priorities out of order. And that is what Peter is pointing us towards. He said, don't forget, right? He just said, you are sojourners, you're pilgrims here. Don't get confused and think that this world is your home. Don't worry about fixing up all the little things, but try to live peaceably as you can and positively as you can within it so that you can have the greatest possible platform for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you see? When we start to take our political affiliations or our uh, association or allegiance to a given human government too far, we will take too much ownership in that. We will become the, the tragic reality that many, uh, many Christians have today. We'll become Americans first who happen to be Christians rather than what we are, actually are. You are a Christian first. You're a believer in Christ first who happens to dwell and reside and do your sojourn and go through your sojourn in the nation of America or Korea or the Philippines or Europe or wherever it is that you are. I realize Europe's not a nation, kind of. (laughs) Nevertheless, the point that Peter is making is that if we rightly understand our full and final allegiance and the fact that we have our citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, that will give us a right relationship to these earthly governments under which we dwell. But it goes further and points out that not only are we just moving through these governments, moving through this time in order to reach our ultimate heavenly destination, but we point, we need to point out that God is the one who created government, and he created it for a purpose. And Peter here aligned, uh, names two of those. First of all, the punishment of evildoers, and second of all, on the flip side, the praise of those who do good. You see, many wonderful things have happened in this world because people sought to do good and to support the government. And when people said, wow, what a, what a wonderful thing you've done for the society, they say, I did it because of my love for Jesus Christ, because of the power of the Holy Spirit within me. You see? So government exists and exists for a good purpose. And while it is imperfect in its execution of that purpose, we see that the government is, in fact, punishing evildoers at uh, certain points and when it's uh, operating correctly, and it exists to praise those who do good. So Peter is saying, be those who do good, quite naturally. And we have to recognize that God is the source of authority. There's sort of an anarchistic, you know, underlying sense 
to many people in the world, well, all of us in our sin nature, and we want to remove all authority from our lives and say, no one has authority over me, and then we may say, except for God. But the reality is God is the one who also uh, made these or uh, put forth these other authorities. So what we have in our uh, biblical worldview is the picture that the, the Lord is the ultimate authority. He is the one who created everything. He's the one who owns everything. Through Jesus Christ, he's the one who redeems us and will ultimately redeem planet Earth. He's the only one who is positionally justified in judging planet Earth as he does in time and as he will uh, in his plan as time goes on. But I want you to read and listen very carefully to the words of Genesis 9. Genesis 9 says, So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Sorry, give you a little background. Noah and his sons have just gotten off the ark. God has just judged the world. He's just flooded the world. And he's setting them up to create to to create this new society on earth that they would be the uh, beginning of. It says, <clears throat> be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat of the flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. And from the hand of every bro man's brother I will require the life of the man. Verse 6 continues. Whoever sheds a man blo man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply it. Then God spoke to Noah and his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy all the earth. Now, um, we're going to just mention in passing what a wonderful comfort this uh, passage is. You see, the earth will remain and humans will remain on the earth until the Lord's plan is completed, which means even in the situations, the dire and frightening situations of uh, viruses and worldwide pandemics and the like, we can be assured that God's plan will finally be fulfilled on the earth, that this hasn't gotten in the way of God's plan one iota. But what we brought this passage up to uh, bring to your attention is verse six, where he says, whoever sheds man blood by man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. God in this passage, at the beginning of this new dispensation, leaving the flood after the flood, is setting up a new time. And in that time, he is making a new authority. He is giving mankind, man, the authority to enforce his moral law. And so he gives human government the authority to execute murderers. And we, we understand that to be the ultimate and most extreme case. This is where God sanctioned and created and authorized humans to have authority over one another. And that's exactly what Peter is playing into when he says that this, these, these uh these governments are set up by the Lord. They are sent from the Lord for specific purposes in God's plan. And so even if the government is doing what's uh, wrong or something that, is, uh, something that seems unwise to us or that we don't like, it is still incumbent upon us to support the government as best we can because it is still a part of the creation of God. They got their authority in, an, in this sense from God himself. And then we get this really powerful statement in verse 15. He says, for this is the will of God. Okay, anytime you hear the phrase, for this is the will of God, I hope you stop dead in your tracks. It is a, a sad reality of the church today to get many people who will try to speak and claim to be prophets. Of course, they're false prophets. Try to speak and says, it's the will of the Lord. The Lord says we should do this. The Lord says we should do that. And we should always respond with, all right, give me chapter and verse. Where did the Lord say that? 
Because that is not how the Lord is communicating with us now. He communicates us through his word and through his spirit. And uh, we need not listen to the fancies of such heretics who think, for whatever reason, that their whims are somehow the will of God. That self-deification is something that we should uh, be repulsed by. However, when we see this positive statement in the word of God, this is the will of God, I hope that you pause and consider the absolute magnitude of that statement. This is a part of God's will for your life. We all wonder what God's will for your life is, and it is readily and continually put forth and made available to us in Scripture if we would but listen. So here is the will of God for you during this coronavirus or COVID-19 um, pandemic. First of all, that by doing good. The response of the Christian under human government is to do good. The resp our response is to do things that, are reflect, that reflect the character and nature, the love, the grace, the peace, the wholeness, the righteousness, and the fullness of God. We are meant to live out that very character of his in our day-to-day -day lives. And that goes down to the very simplest uh, expressions. It could be loving and supporting your neighbor, maybe reaching out and finding out if someone that you know doesn't have food or, or toilet paper or some basic necessities. It could be preparing meals for others. It could be standing up and speaking the truth in various uh, situations and spots. Whatever we're doing that we're meant to be doing good in this uh, world around us. Now, we're not defined by doing good. We're defined by spreading the gospel, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. But a natural outgrowth and outplay of that will be that we support and do those things which are, which are good. And what will that do? The effect that that will have as we live out by the power of Christ, by the, the Holy Spirit, according to the word, why we live out that goodness and, and we see those good things come forth, we see that it will silence, and this word here has, is a very vivid word picture of putting a muzzle on something, right? If you've got an ox or a, even a dangerous animal, we can imagine putting a muzzle around it so that it cannot uh, bite anything or, or, in this case, speak. You can't uh, imagine something more demeaning than putting a muzzle on a person or stuffing a sock in their mouth, and that's exactly what Peter's saying. Now, a couple of weeks ago, before our resurrection celebrations, we talked about the many ways in which this world will denigrate, downplay, slander the church and the body of Christ in this world. And what is it that's going to silence them? It's going to be the good and godly living of believers in the world today. It will put a muzzle on them so that they will feel and know that they are absolutely foolish in their ridiculous speech. And then we, he starts to describe these people who are being muzzled by the godly living of Christians. And uh, they are the ignorance, uh, sorry, uh, we'll silence the ignorance, as it says. Um, sorry, the ignorance of foolish men. You will silence or muzzle the ignorance of foolish men. So the ignorance here is agonosia. It has the word gnosko, which means to know, and the negative particle a, ah, which means they don't know. They have no knowledge. They're void of knowledge. Their accusations are ignorant, and that's absolutely the case. When people seek to slander the gospel of Jesus Christ, they are going against all wisdom, all knowledge. They have no knowledge. Their uh, accusations, their slander is based not in reality, and we silence it by uh, how we live. And finally, uh, they're said to be, in terms of the descriptor, is that they are foolish men, literally mindless men. They're just shills for their spiritual position of deadness and separation from God. They've drunk the Kool-Aid. They've accepted everything that the world and the, the godless world system has put forward. They're just slaves to it and enslaved to it. They are ignorant. They lack knowledge and they lack mindset. They're mindless in their pers uh, persecution of the truth and the facts of how the church behaves on earth, how believers behave in your communities, in your workplace, in your school, 
is what will silence them, muzzle them. It's what will shut them up. And he continues on, and he uses this little, uh, little phrase in verse 16, as free. Now, I want to stop and pause and just enjoy this for a moment. If I tell you, you are free, that already is a positive statement. It brings comfort and happiness and joy. If I say, hey, you're free, right? Someone comes and, you know, says that they've got a huge problem. If you could just pronounce, you're free from that. How, how that would overjoy our hearts, right? And yet that statement is incomplete. It needs context. Just the simple statement, you are free. It needs context and explanation. You're free, but from what or from whom? We find that we are free in Christ. The NIV sta- uh, translates Galatians 5, 1, or sorry, yeah, 5, one saying, it is for freedom that is Christ that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So what are you free from? It says, for freedom Christ has set you free. You are a free person in Christ. You have a freedom that no human would know apart from the provision and the freedom of Christ. What are you free from? Well, you're free first and foremost from the bondage and oppressive slavery of your sin nature. Free in Christ forever from your sinful desires, lusts, passions that would destroy you. But that's not all. You're free from the yoke of bondage to the principle of law or the law of Moses. You are free from the idea of approaching the God of the universe based on a set of works and demerits and rewards. You are free from that relationship with the God of the universe, You're, because that is always a bondage to us. Once we set up our legal system, or we even look to the Bible to get God's legal system, we find we're always crushed under the weight of that of our inability to keep the, any principle of law to please God. Furthermore, f- much less the full righteous standard of God. F- next, in Christ, you are free from the authority and slavery of the ungodly world system. This world system is sin sick and absolutely enslaved to its desires. It has been shocking to me, and I don't mind saying from this electronic pulpit, to see that as the uh, government decided what was an essential business and what was not an essential business, in Colorado at least, alcohol and um, marijuana shops were somehow uh, set out as essential. That's grotesque task. That is a sign of an enslaved and sad culture in which we live. But you're free from that enslaved culture that says, just look after your next high, just look after your next buzz. You're, in, you're free from the enslavement of that culture that says, just pursue every pleasure and see if you can get the most pleasure out of life, no matter what it does to yourself or to anyone else. You are free from the ungodly world system that has set itself up against the God of the universe. Not only that, you are free from the control and the deception of Satan, the enemy of our souls. You are free from that indeed. Now, as with any of these things, we can choose to uh, abide, we can choose to make ourselves slaves again to our sin nature, to the principle of law, to the ungodly world system, or to the deception of Satan. But God has given us and provided us the freedom in his word and his son, Jesus Christ, so that you never need to go back to that again. And that is why Peter then moves on to the next logical statement. He said, you are free. Is as free, but the, the principle is it's that you are absolutely free, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants to God. So if you want to be a spiritual grown-up, you better read the warnings on the label, okay? Note, Peter still isn't using imperatives here. He's still using, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the word using here translates echo, which is the Greek word for to have. And it's in a present active participle. So he's still describing what authentic faith and spirituality looks like. That's why we've called this this series Real Faith, because Peter is describing time and time again what a mature Christian walk looks like, how we relate to the world around us, how we relate to the government, how we relate to each other in, in the church, and on and on. But Peter still isn't using bossy pants imperatives to get his 
point across. He's just describing what a mature Christian life looks like. And mature Christians don't use their freedom as a cloak. This is epikaluma, which sounds very much like apocalypsis, right? Apocalypsis is where we get the, uh, the book of Revelation, the apocalypsis. And it means to uncover, right? To uncover something. So in the book of Revelation, the apocalypse of John, the apocalypsis, God is uncovering his plan for the end. But here, this word is used in a different sense. He's saying don't use it as a cloak, as an epikaluma, as something that covers up to cover up your wrongdoings. This is an overcovering or something to cover up what is hidden beneath. And Peter's point here is that it doesn't make any logical sense for us to use our freedom that we've been given in Christ to cover up vice. Now, the word vice is the Greek word kakia, which is, uh, and, and don't think that khaki pants are evil, Khaki pants are fine. They're just dorky. Get you some jeans, everything will be fine. But khakis are not evil. Kakia, however, does mean evil. And it's generally something that is bad, evil, wrong. So it's not specifically uh, our connotation for vice. It's just anything that is ungodly in nature and ungodly in character. So now we want to note something, that this is a regular theme in Scripture because it can be a problem. We as, uh, as believers, particularly as immature believers, can get to this point where we say, I have grace, I'm forgiven, therefore I'm just going to go do whatever I want, right? And that's why these admonitions are in Scripture, because it's a ridiculous and illogical way for us to think. It's the wrong way for us to think. Using the grace of God to cover up evil is silliness, is, so, brings only sorrow for ourself. Paul addressed this issue very clearly in Romans 6, 1 through 6, he said, or 1 through 11, rather. He said, but what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or how do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, for he has died and has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, you are not to live in sin. You're not to live according to the lusts of your flesh because it is is slavery. Think about that for a minute. God has at once and for all freed us from the penalty of our sin at the cross of Jesus Christ. And when you trusted in Jesus Christ, you were forgiven forever from that. And at the same time, because of your position in Christ, you were freed from the power, from the authority of sin in your life. You never need to live according to your sin nature for one moment again for the rest of your life. Think for a moment on how tragic and how heartbreaking it is to see a, a, a woman break out of, break free of, be liberated from an abusive relationship, and how heartbreaking it is to see her go back into that uh, abusive situation into that abusive relationship under any circumstances. And yet that's exactly what we do when having been freed from our sin nature, we longing, longingly move he fall headlong into that life of sin. Sin only brings slavery. Sin only brings bondage. Sin only breaks relationships. It never builds them up. Sin only brings separation between humans and most importantly, separation between humans and God. It doesn't make any sense that we would want to, that we would desire for that from which God has freed us. Rather than be a slave to sin, Peter says, be bond servants of God. Now, I want you to consider this. The highest titles that the world can uh, confer on a person, maybe doctor, governor, president, uh, king, none of them 
outrank the simple statement of bondservant to God. Recognize that the Lord is your new loving master, and in his service you are more free from all the things that would harm and destroy and embarrass and make you ashamed than you've ever been before. The power of his Holy Spirit is giving you constant strength to to resist, to move away from, to rely upon what he's given, to trust in his word, and to accept his uh, real view of reality and be deceived no longer. If you want to be one thing, I hope you want to be a bondservant a slave of the God of the universe. Because, as Romans 6 goes on to explain, you'll be a slave to something. You can be a slave to the sin nature. You can be a slave to this world. You can be a slave to the enemy, the, the, the liar, Satan. Or you can be a slave, a servant of the living God. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you already positionally are and have been declared his property, his freed servant. And now it just comes to us to live in that reality. Peter here gives four simple expressions. He says, it's free, not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Verse 17, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Let's look at these ones. Honor all. The word people is inserted for clarity, but the idea is honor all. We are to be in right relationship to all people, lifting all people up, whether they be government authorities, household authorities, church authorities, or just your neighbor across the street. Our position on this earth is to honor all. And we say, but all are not worthy of honor. And I would say none are worthy of honor. And yet every person is created in the very image of God. And therefore, it is our part as believers to be constantly lifting up, building up, hoping to encourage others so that they might know the grace that is there and to be found in Christ. So he starts off, honor all, as this over, overarching statement. Then he gets specific and says, love the brotherhood. The correct attitude which we are to take with one another is one of uplifting others, caring for our brothers and sisters in Christ. John 13, 34 uh, gives this new commandment of Jesus that we must pay heed to and I hope is constantly on your mind. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. First, we want to note it's a new commandment because prior to this, the Old Testament had commanded that people would love one another as you love yourself. But now we see Jesus opens this up because we know we don't always love ourselves well. But that's all the love that, was, that is in us as natural unsaved people. But now as a Christian, there's a new love available to you. And as you continue to look into the word of God and to spend time in prayer and grow in your Christian life, then you will find that the love that Christ expressed towards you and towards the whole world is available for you to express towards your brothers and sisters in Christ, yea, towards the whole world, a love that looks to the better good of others far beyond the best good of ourselves or our own selfish desires. That is the mark of the believer, that we are to love one another as Christ loved us. Then he says, fear God. I want to note the fear of the Lord is a, is a topic that we simply uh, will not have time to delve into, but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord is what motivates us to live in a godly way. And you say, wait a minute, are we supposed to be afraid of God? Well, I wouldn't put it quite that way. I would say that the fear of the Lord is rightly understood as correctly understanding who God is and who I am in relationship to that. And if I understand, if I have a right respect and fear for God as the God of the universe, as the creator, the designer of life, as the ultimate author of all moral reality and reality in general, then I'm going to listen to what he says, and I'm going to live the way that he wants to. However, if I don't believe that God is the God of the universe, the omniscient, omnipotent, omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful being that oversees and to whom we are all responsible, then I'm going to live like God is important when it's convenient to me. 
This fear of God motivates us to treat one another correctly. Once we understand who God is and who we are in relationship to him as needy sinners who are objects of his grace and love, so we will extend that to others. And finally, he ends this uh, section with that simple phrase, honor the king. And I want to remind you, the king in Peter's time was despicable. The Caesars, the lives of the Caesars were just a absolute tabloid rag of disgusting, filthy, power-grabbing, hate-mongering worldliness personified. And Peter says, honor him as much as it can, as much as you can, honor him. So, three conclusions for you in this, uh, in this morning's study. One, support the government. If the government asks you to stay at home, then stay at home. If the government asks you to do something that you don't like but does not contradict the word of God, then seek to support. That's not a comfortable thing for me to say. I don't want to say it, but it's what the word of God has to say to us. But we do want to note with a reasonable caveat that there is a time wherein civil disobedience is acceptable in the word of God. Civil disobedience is acceptable when and only when the government commands you to do something that God has forbidden or forbids you to do something that God has commanded. If the government or any other authority on earth forbids you to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, you can go tell them where to put it and share the gospel all the louder. If the gospel or if, the, if some authority tells you that you can uh, no longer proclaim the word of God or love the brethren or uh, celebrate the Lord's table, then you can tell them where to stick it. But if the government just tells you to do something that you're not very fond of or that you don't like, you can register your complaint, but your job as a Christian is ultimately to support that. And thus we will silence, conclusion two, the foolishness of those who make accusations against us. In this way, by seeking to be the best citizens we possibly can, we will make that um, known unto them. And finally, and most importantly, walk in your true freedom in Christ. Grow evermore in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in faith and bring forth uh, allow his spirit rather to bring forth in you the fruit of the holy spirit that love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control you will find that it is yours as you live and you continue to walk towards jesus christ and abide in him and i hope that even through this trial that you're choosing to do that every day in every moment. Let's close our time in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity, uh, this time that we have to uh, study your word, even in this trial. Lord, especially in this trial, it gives us as a church such a great opportunity to proclaim the hope that is found in your Son, in your word. Lord, to know your truth. Might we, in all humility and love, seek to live out your life in the freedom for which you have made us free in Christ and live in, as sojourners, as pilgrims, as strangers in this world so that more might come with us and glorify your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.